everyone doing tonight? Thanks for being here for Artist Talks. Uh, my name is Stephanie Parrish. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Public Programs. And it's a real pleasure to have you here for Artist Talks. We do this um, the second Thursday of every month. Um, tonight we have Sarah Sistrom, who uh, graciously accepted the invitation to come okay. talk and immediately knew she was going to talk about the Rauschenberg. I think like within 30 minutes, you were like, that is the object. Often it takes artists a lot longer to come and select something. But a little bit about Sarah. Um, she's a contemporary Native American artist, scholar, consultant, and educator. Um, she's Hannes Coos and an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and the Ciusla Tribes from the south coast of Oregon. Good job. She grew up between the Umpqua River Valley and Portland, Oregon. She earned a BS at PSU in 2005 and an MFA with distinction from the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn in 2007. And she's represented here in Portland by the Ogden Gallery. Uh, she completed a Ford Family Gold Spot Artist Residency at Crow Shadow in July of this year. And her, uh, in which she created a body of work called Collections, and that's going to be on display next year at the Halley Ford Museum. T uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow? I thought it was 2014. It starts tomorrow. Wow. Okay. They got so the she has one. the Halley Ford exhibition, and she currently has a solo show at the Missoula Art Museum. Um, a show called Ballast, and that will be on view through January 26th. And those notes were from me, so that's on yeah. me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, please join me in welcoming Sarah to Artist Talks. Thanks, you guys. And I'm also really grateful to the Portland Art Museum for bringing me again to get to share some of my ideas and discoveries with you. It's really always a super thrill. Um, on a lot of levels for me, and I'm really grateful that you would all come out to hear some of these new ideas that I'm going to share with you. So today we're going to talk about Rauschenberg, and we're going to look at this piece, which is called Patrician Barnacle Scale. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, this conversation. I want to let you know that in my talk today, I'm going to bring, be bringing to you some ideas that might be challenging to ideas that you already hold. Um, I'm doing this for all of our benefit, so while it may make you kind of uncomfortable, I'm just asking you to bear with it and um, entertain some new perspectives. Um, so today we're going to be looking at this, and I'll be filling you in on some biographical information. While I do that, I welcome you to get up and look at the work. I want you to look at it up close, and from a distance, I want you to consider the scale. I know it's nerve-wracking, right? Come on up. I want you to consider the scale as it relates to your body and to the others that are walking around it. Um, all of these things will give you kind of an emotive read that are worth entertaining. Um, I also am going to ask that you hold your questions until I open the floor, and I'll do that at a couple different times, just that way I can get through kind of some linear concepts that I'm trying to work with here. So Robert Rauschenberg lived from 1925 to 2008 and was born to an Anglo descent mother and a Cherokee and German father. He grew up in Port Arthur, Texas, studied art at the Kansas City Art Institute, also in Paris in the Black Mountain School, with John Cage, Joseph Albers, Mears Cunningham, Cy Twombly, Jasper Johns, etc. Throughout his career, he worked in paint, printmaking, collage, sculpture, combinations of all of these forms, performance, and dance. His work and ideas provided seminal influences and an innovation to most of the avant-garde movements that happened during his lifetime. His work is looked at as a point of reference and pride within the Western canon of fine art of the accomplishment of American fine art. His work was celebrated, awarded, and embraced for the majority of his life. An important early accomplishment of his work was to win the grand prize of the Venice Biennale in 1964 for America. This is an international exhibition that works to give a con comprehensive look at the contemporary concerns in art around the work at the time of the exhibition. By achieving this honor, he placed his work in America at the center and top of the world's esteem for artistic invention during his lifetime. In doing this, he achieved permanent credibility to the ideas that are contained in his work and America. In the Western canon of fine art, we have a tradition of deconstructing meaning through analyzing all of the available elements. We can look at the historical relevance and theoretical concerns and formal elements of craft, design, and materials, the emotive impact and content, as well as a look at any language or symbols offered up by the artist as well. In reference to his work, Rauschenberg often stated it existed in the gap between art and life. 
and random sampling that works with ideas of gestalt psychology, something that is made of many parts and yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts, broadly the general quality and character of something. To begin my discussion of this piece, I will investigate some of the individual components of the piece beginning with the language contained in the title. Patrician is defined as the original aristocratic families of ancient Rome and as a synonym for Arist 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 help me. Thanks, guys. Um, my students are here. Uh, in modern English, English. Barnacle, commonly thought of today as a crustacean that attaches itself to other sea animals, wood and rocks. It takes its name from a duck that originally was thought to spring from the wood area it was first located in, although they were later discovered to be from the Arctic. The origin of the name sharing comes from early speculation that the barnacle may also have sprung from the wood it was commonly found on, also for the plume-like appendages that these animals use to collect food. It should also be noted that the barnacle is not thought of as a parasite it, to the entities it is attached to, but more a passenger. Scale. There are two interesting meanings, maybe three, associated with this word as it applies to this object. The first is scale, the relative size of the object as they relate to one another. The other is of the action word to climb. The third may be being scales on a, another animal that you would see, which we could look to in here to see. When I considered these definitions in relation to the piece, I identify the latter as the stand in for the hierarchy of the aristocracy or upper echelon of any class system. The piece that rests on it that is larger, this guy here, yet similarly is a similar and inverted shape, I read as the stand in for the other side of society, everything beside the aristocracy. In that component, we can read the rest of the world with the imagery contained there. When I apply the word scale to this conversation, an idea of relationship that exists between the aristocracy and the remainder of the society that is being looked at and the question of who is climbing, who is raised. Um, so at this point, I wanna bring you guys into the conversation to ask questions or start to talk about any of the content that you're reading in this. Um, one of the things that we're working with in my class, and these folks are here with you today, um, it's a studio art class, we're working with Xerox transfer technique, which comes out of Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg invents this technique that we see here, um, this transfer. And so he was, this came as kind of a happy studio accident. Um, in this one, he's using uh, lighter fluid to get the transfer to happen. So what happened in his studio is he had a stack of magazines sitting on a canvas. Some kind of solvent spilled onto it. The next day when he came back and removed the magazines, the image from the magazine had transferred onto the canvas, and that broke up a new idea for him about importing imagery from the real world into these paintings. And that worked in concert with other importing of objects having to do with everyday life. And this, this piece was done in 1980, which is pretty advanced in his career with all of these techniques. But this piece references the lineage of those um, experiences that he created for us in that work. You see bed sheets that have been used here, all of this imagery that he's importing from the real world in concert with those, sharing a sort of an intimacy between those images and the materials. Um, that, that is an important stylistic component of his work and then it also informs a lot of contemporary visual media. Um, that, that look is something that we got from him but that is being referenced again and again in the way that machines are now mashing up all of our visual culture. Um, and I'm still talking and I know I asked you for questions and that's to give you a chance to pull them together. Does anybody want to talk to any of that stuff right off the bat? No? Okay. Um, the second part of my conversation gets into theory. Um, theory in art is the lineage of ideas as they pass from, from one movement to the next. And I'm gonna make a jump here for you that um, is, was new for me. Um, when I was being trained in the Western canon of fine art, I often looked to Rauschenberg as a touch point to my own work. I had an immediate deep understanding and attachment to his work. It's often called quixotic, and that's a word that refers to the romantic. Um, we all are susceptible to this sensation, and I'm not talking Roman, I'm talking love. Um, and I think it's a fair place to start to describe a popular sensation held by viewers of his work. Uh, when I was in graduate school in New York, I was lucky enough to view a retrospective of his combines, 
which some of you may be familiar with. Um, they're some of the most famous objects of American art to date. Um, it was a thrill to see them in person and to be able to have an intimate viewing experience with them. The thing I was not anticipating was the biographical information that was painted on the wall of the exhibit. Um, the first line of his native ancestry is identified there. Um, for me, that changed everything. It's a really big, a really big moment and component to looking at his work. In native art theory, um, native art is defined as artwork that's made by a person who has native ancestry. Our thinking is that if you are a descendant of this culture, then you and the thing that you do are a part of our culture. In all of my education, everything I'd read about him and studied of him, his Cherokee ancestry was never mentioned. There were a few passing comments he made in public that kind of pointed to it, but it was never discussed. Um, when I looked at his work with this knowledge in mind, the final piece fell into place, and the point of view of his work and or of his voice got even louder for me. In the Native American art, we have three categories of fine art. They are traditional, which is artwork that's made by indigenous people in the same way it has been made for thousands of years. The craft design and material usage, gathering and treatment are all performed in the same way. All components of the knowledge contained in that practice is taught from an elder who is taught by an elder. In this way, the knowledge is passed from one generation to the next. The second category of fine art that we have is customary. We're calling it customary now. We're working to find perfect language. Artwork made by indigenous people who have traditional training. This work displays visual evidence of the traditional form but deviates from the traditional form in one or two Two or more significant ways. You can think of the work of Gail Tremblay, you may know. She makes baskets with film um, to kind of give yourself an idea of what we're talking about there. And then contemporary Native American art, what I make, James Lavador, Marie Watt, Robert Rauschenberg, artwork that is made by indigenous people that operates outside the traditional form. So it is inventing new formal qualities that are not driven from traditional knowledge. Um, the most important thing for you guys to walk away from after understanding those things is that all three of these categories are being made by Native American people today, which is to dispel the myth that we do not exist, that we are extinct. Um, through this lens, the artwork of Rauschenberg can be looked at in the contemporary, uh, in the category of contemporary Native American art, and I hope you will update and add this to your concept of Native art as well as your thoughts about the work of Robert Rauschenberg. So those are my notes. Um, now it's time for us to kind of start to work with some of these ideas as a group, which I know is, is hard sometimes to crack open the conversation being turned back to you, but it's easier maybe if we start to look at some of the elements and try to think about what those are, or if you guys want to ask questions about all of the new stuff I just threw at you, because I know there's a lot of new ideas contained in that. Yes, ma'am. I want to know really bad too, but um, I can. You can reach. No, don't walk on it. Just put your finger up there. So you, that was my question. You're not. You can't. This is not. No. I I wouldn't. This cost over a million dollars. I I wouldn't touch it with my body. Over a million. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The. Um, this is a little long. My current work costs over twenty-four million. Yeah. Yeah. I. Sorry, I, I did ask him to, that's my fault, I'm sorry. It's not open, Thank it's you, dusty. very dusty, thank you. Um, and that get, the money gets us a little bit into some of the interesting political relationships that are behind this as well. So you guys might be aware that Blue Sky Gallery, which is a um, nonprofit, community-based museum, or not museum, but gallery collection, thank you. Collective, Collective. that's the word I was looking for, thank you. Um, is owned by his son, Christopher Rauschenberg. Okay, I know, he gets mad when I say that, I, thanks. Um, it's run by Christopher Rauschenberg, who's his son. And um, this piece was purchased by the museum in order to fund that. Am I, am I following the history? Maybe you'll tell the us the history. Is yeah. That, um, when they were looking, when they were, they were looking to buy a, a space in the Casino building, uh, he went to his father Chris is on the board, he's, he's not the director, he's just one of the, one of the uh, board directors, uh, but asked Flower to donate a piece uh, that, that they could sell uh, for the money to buy the million dollar space in the Soto building. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they also approached the museum to try and find a patron who would buy it and then donate 
Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the arts, I think, had a write off too for donating the piece. Sure, it was good business for everyone. So that's the dirtier side of things that actually ends up being filled with flowers and kind of a great thing. Um, thank you. If our collective information can help, it's good, right? Um, yeah, so, and then that speaks too to uh, American values, art market values, and the prestige of Ro Rauschenberg in all of those venues where they come together. Another interesting component of the transfer technique is that you get a reverse of the information because what you're doing is you're transferring the information from one piece to the other and so the part that's now visible is the back side of the picture. And so that has a couple conceptual pieces that are kind of interesting. Part of my research protocol is that I speak to the artists that I'm going to speak about so that I am informed by their desire when I speak of their work now because Rauschenberg was deceased by the time I started researching and working to develop him into my theoretical approach. I, I went to Christopher and um, for a couple things it was really important for me to have permission to do. One, um, to speak at all about him, and this is a native value system, a native protocol. Uh, secondly, it was really critical that he, um, he was comfortable with me revealing the Native American um, component because I am not interested in us speculating in this conversation on why that was not part of the mainstream knowledge attached to him. What I am interested in is that it is okay with his family that I, I speak to that. And Christopher said that not only was it, that it would be okay with his dad, but his dad didn't ever want anyone to think he was only just one thing. And another component that he thought was really important and wanted to share with people that might help kids and people coming up was that he's dyslexic, which is something I am, and lots of artists are actually. And dyslexia, what we understand now, is actually kind of a beautiful way to think. It's a three-dimensional way of processing information. And so a person who takes in information that way and their brain operates in the third dimension comes up with unpredictable and beautiful, sometimes interesting results that a person who thinks in a linear manner would not necessarily come to. So the Xerox transfer method has kind of an inverse way of saying hello to that. If you look at the, anything that has text on this, it reads backwards, you know? So it's just, I always look to those things as a nod to this part of his personality that, or his, his um, intellectual experience that he loved and he treasured and, and wanted people to know about. Um, and so that's a little bit more insight for you guys, not only on those protocols, but on the um, kind of how I'm starting to read some of these things together. All right, who else has got questions? If this was a podcast, what time That's a great question, and I think we would, could talk about that collectively. I mean, it was made in 1980. He invented these kinds of processes and this kind of style in the late 50s going into the 60s. Um, the imagery that he's working with here goes really, it has a lot of contemporary stuff, but it kind of goes back and forth in time a lot. Hey, Allie. Um, I think maybe 100. I mean, the patrician, that word is very old. That, that speaks to Roman aristocracy, right? So that's a long ways back. I mean, but we've also got these references of like reflectors from cars that would put us 50 years back. You know, we've got um, the hardware on here. It's all kind of, to me, in the last 100 years, I don't see necessarily many images that go back beyond that. That go back beyond 1900? I don't think so. Do you see anything that's older than that? I don't think so. Okay. What's that? Oh, yeah, thanks. Great, great read. Yeah, that would be ancient. That would be early, early times. Geology. And I looked into that 1419 a lot, and I didn't get anything real specific. When I Year, you know, like a year ago when I started first thinking about this piece, I read it wrong and I got, like, I, I think I got, I got something out of the date that I had transposed out of it, but in my research lately, I'm going to say that that's arbitrary because 1419 or 1914 or, you know, any of those combinations didn't have too much that was direct. Um, but I love that one with the guy in the middle of it. I think he's super lovely. Looking at it 
more closely, uh, there's this, this overarching theme of man's imprint on the earth. Mm -hmm. And, and this, because you got, you got uh, animals, things from nature, uh, technology, um, um, how the, earth, the, the, the land has been changed by man's um, influence. Mm -hmm. Also a natural landscape, and just uh, sort of layers on top of layers of how we've affected this place. Okay. So you're going into an environmental read, man, I think, I man, think, and the I planet. Think reference with, with the, the mixture of things around here. Yeah. But we know, yeah, we it does kind of contain the whole world, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. But uh, but we we know that uh, man is dominating the theme of the the piece. Uh huh. Well, it is a thing of man, certainly. Um, what else? What else are you guys thinking about when you see this? Mm -hmm. social scale, um, the notion, you know, and when you kind of uh, add to that um, the, the bulk of, the bulk that you're talking about for the, the main piece, how he's kind of, he's chosen to do all, all of his transfer and imprinting on this piece, um, but the, the latter itself kind of remains untouched. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know no, this, this was, th these ideas that I spoke to are coming out of the deconstruction of the language in, contained in the title. Okay. So I'm looking at the title and I'm trying to figure out how that would go. And so this is my interpretation and it brings up a great thing that you would mention that and that is art's potential to speak to us. Um, not only from the intention of the artist, but also to our own kind of experience in the world. And um, that's what makes it really powerful is we can have this personal kind of thing. That's what the gestalt psychology is talking about, I think a little bit. Um, and so, and because he's gone, you know, now we have what he left to work with. And, um, and that's why looking at things like the cultural perspective start to be really valuable keys to decoding these things because um, that those perspectives are all really, um, there's a lot of knowledge in those perspectives that we can use to work with. So, as far as your question, those were those were those were what that those what those things meant to me when I started to apply them to the third dimension and how this worked. And of course, those things are informed, and it's really important that we would we would note this. Those are informed by my experience on the planet and how I think the world works and how all those things go together. And that's all any of us can do when we're interpreting art is bring in all of our own stuff and try to keep clear that that those ideas are not to be put, like the idea of his ancestry, that's a fact. My interpretation of these things, that's a conversation. You know, the difference there. So that's a really critical thing to talk about. Um, and when I was looking at this, I was thinking about the class system and I was thinking about um, contemporary experience about what we're looking at now with the 1% and all the different kind of who's, who's what part. And so, and I, thinking about hierarchies and ladders and climbing to the top and all that kind of stuff. And that this to me really refers to that conversation and this is big and it's, it's got incredible dimension and there's all these massive components Yet this is in this thing is here, and it's got its own kind of place and part to it. So, yeah. Thanks, Cass. That's a good question. Um, who else has ideas to share or questions? What's your opinion for why the ladder is in? Or for what? Why is the ladder there? I think I don't think that's exactly all about. 
Well, I, I think that it definitely, it serves an architectural purpose, but I'm reading it as a comparison. I'm reading them at, well, it's a com comparison to these two components, but also to show that they are related and that they, one leans on the other, you know? Um, and also, the, another thing, for, from the visual perspective, the ladder is hollow, and the, this structure, which I'm placing as the other components of the class system, is from the surface, this is a solid situation. So that brings in another critical read of the, the division. I, I can flip it in my brain in a lot of ways. Um, I, th I think the aluminum is a design element to cap it and to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, it could also be for support. Uh huh. I don't know. Maybe I'll say it. I think something that has to read the bottom. When you're on top of a ladder and you fall off of a ladder, you land on your head. Uh huh. That's great. I mean, why did he take the time to put the aluminum on both sides? I don't know if it was just to take a buffet at Delta at top. Well, I also think, I mean, I see another element of aluminum in the cord right here, so that is another kind of yeah. design element to bring t things together. Um, I love that you are spinning it in your mind. Just falling off the ladder and landing on his head, and then, and then all of this sort of mankind is done sort of stuck to it. That's great. Now, if I wouldn't have spoken to the native component, would you be reading this man versus nature? Uh, no, but I, man is in it only because of that picture. If I was standing on that side and there's no man walking by those two sheets, I wouldn't have put man in. Uh huh. Interesting. That's good. Thank you. Um, any other kinds of questions? Yes. I mean, that does kind of like bounce something that is, I think, something. The marginalization you might encounter? Yeah, I mean, like, whether, you know, in, you know, in all forms, I mean, you know, the, the notion of, the, the notion that it has to be specifically approached to create contemporary art is, is like, itself problematic. You know, mm -hmm. problematic. Bringing that up brings up another problem that exists in the Western canon that doesn't exist in other places, and, and I would entertain the conversation for everybody. And part of the problem in the Western canon is if you are one thing, you cannot be another. And so this is why Native American often, art oftentimes is discounted as fine art because it may have a spiritual or a uh, functional use. And now in Native culture, we say as well as. Um, so you are this, but you are also that, and you are also this. And so that is a bridge that makes possible to broaden our idea to understand and to contain all of these um, complicated point of views that may in some way challenge what you came into the conversation with. So, um, and, and then that can help the Western canon to grow and, it, and has, it, it opens up a lot of new opportunities for thought and potential invention in, um, in, in that theory. So um, this is where uh, we can meet and um, enhance our experience. Um, but it, it's, it does challenge um, these exclusive kind of thoughts that we have. If it is this, it can't be that, you know? Which um, ends up having unfortunate extinctions attached to it. So um, we're trying in education and institutions and theory um, and all of these places to start to broaden our thoughts to contain multiple. 
points of view simultaneously, which can be uncomfortable. So thank you, all of you, for being willing to flex with these things because I give them to you out of love, not at, out of an idea of torturing you or what you knew. It's um, to expand what you're working with. A pattern that yeah, refers to that. So the end of it is lava. Uh huh. This will mean a lot of fire and things there that torture this um, for us as Mayans. Uh huh. You're doing a really good job. Alejandro, that's a, a beautiful um, correlation, and I'm, I think that was really generous of you to share that with us. Um, did you guys follow her? Could you hear her over there? Yeah, okay, good. Um, that's great, and I think he would be so delighted. This is my fantasy of him, because he's my hero, so I have those things, and I, I think he would love that. Um, I think those things were important to him, that you had a multitude of reference to what he was doing. He wanted to speak with you with all of his being. And so that, that you're finding those places in the world in it, I think, are um, markers of him achieving his urge. And I think also by referencing all of these images from around the world, he is trying to open that dialogue. So thank you for bringing your experience to it. Other, other questions, other ideas? Is it time for wine and crackers? <laughs> I think it might be.